so Mark 14. Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 14, verses 51 through 52. Two verses, 51 through 52. Uh, so uh, that should only take two and a half hours this morning. <laughs> so, uh, so Mark 14, 51, 52. As you turn there, um, I'll tell you, uh, kind of to set the stage of this passage. Um, so I'm a, I'm a child of the 90s. I was born in the late 70s. That means I came of age in the mid-90s. I was a teenager in early 20s and the mid to late 90s. In the mid-90s, your radio was more important in your car than your car. I don't know if you know it. But in the mid-90s, people would spend big bucks on the radio. They wouldn't spend big bucks on what was under the hood necessarily. Right? And so it was a big, when you got a car, when you turned 16, the first thing you did was take out the factory radio. <laughs> and then you went to maybe Radio Shack, maybe, and pick kids, ask your parents what Radio Shack was, <laughs> maybe Best Buy, and you picked out a new radio to go in your car. And you didn't just get a radio, maybe you also got an equalizer with dials and lights, and so when the radio would play, boom, 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 like the, the lights, boom, boom, boom. Right? And you would put up front, you put these small little speakers right at the corner, and they were called tweeters. Right? And in the back, you would put sub woofers. And in the back, you would take these subs, you'd get these big speakers like this. Right? You'd get two of them, and you would make a plywood box holder for your sub woofers. Right? And you would take the saw, and you'd cut out the circles, and you'd put the sub woofers in the circles that you cut out. And you would drill that together, or maybe nail that together, and you put that in the back of your car. If, say, you had a convertible Volkswagen Rabbit, you would take down the back seat so that your subwoofers would be exposed. So that when you drove through town, everyone of a certain age would roll their eyes and complain about you. And you would roll through town. And that was a very big deal, right? And we found, you know, if you were good at it, you spent a lot of money on it, you would go through, say, mm -hmm. hypothetically, downtown Lexington, right? And you would roll through and you would park because cruising was outlawed in downtown Lexington in the mid-90s, but there was a loophole. You could ride through twice and then you could park for 15 minutes and then you could ride through again, yeah. hypothetically. Right? And so you would go and you would park and the people who were really good with their subwoofers would take like a quarter and they would put it on top of their car and every time, boom, 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 the quarter would go, choo, 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 choo. and that's how you knew that somebody made a quality subwoofer box. There's an education for you if you did not grow up in the mid to late 90s, right? And so that was good times. And I, I love that because I like music. Music moves me. I'm a music guy. It changes my mood. I tell people all the time, like, Jesus saves my soul, but Sam Cooke could change my mood. He could save my mood for five minutes at a time, right? If I have a frustrating day, then if I go home and I, and I hear, if you ever change your mind, yeah, then I'm okay. <laughs> And I'm good for five minutes at a time, right? But now in the mid-90s, I wasn't listening to Sam Cooke. In the mid-90s, I was listening to some other stuff. Right? I was listening to Pearl Jam and Eddie Vedder, and those were not good movies and songs, right? Like, we were depressed, and we were angsty, and that's just how it was, right? But, but in the late 90s, I had some friends, and I've mentioned this friend to you before. His name was Tommy. And uh, he had a 1972 K5 Blazer. I've mentioned that Blazer before because it's a very important part of my growing up. Right? And so Tommy had a 1972 K5 Blazer. It had some rust around the fenders. It was faded green. And in the summertime, we would take the hard top off of that K5 Blazer. And Tommy had in the back <coughs> four subwoofers. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. Right? And we would roll through town in Little Red. Right? And there would be about four to six of us, and we would pile in this 1972 K5 Blazer, and in the summertime with the top off, Tommy would just say, alternate who's driving, and we would just take different people, would take the wheel, right? And at that time in our lives, in the mid-90s, he had also, I don't know if you know this, but there used to be a 10-disc or 20-disc CD changer that you would put in the back of your vehicle, and you would have a remote that you would control up front because that was just fancy, 
and he would show it off, right? And so Tommy had a 20 disc CD changer, and we would drive all day, because at that time you could afford to drive all day with gas in a 1972 K5 Blazer. And we would drive and we would look for trails and maybe we'd go on like wildlife land trails and maybe we'd go on backwoods and maybe we'd find like a little creek to cross or maybe we'd just drive through town. But at that time, it wasn't Sam Cook and it wasn't Pearl Jam. At that time in my life, there were two CDs that encompassed those years of my life. And that was Alabama's Greatest Hits, Volume 1 and 2. Right? Because that's a two disc set because you can't contain Alabama to one CD. Right? And so we would ride through and because also if you're like forging creeks and in the woods, you should not be listening to Pearl Jam or Sam Cooke, you should be listening to Alabama. Right? And so we would roll through and, Al and inevitably, whoever was behind the wheel, we would alternate who was behind the wheel. And inevitably, whoever behind, was behind the wheel when Alabama came on had certain responsibilities. Right? And if Dixieland Delight came on, you should find a back road, right? And you should find a chubby old groundhog and a croaking bullfrog. <laughs> and if Song of the South came on, then people should put their hands over their hearts, right? And they should sing Song of the South. I only know today what the TVA was because Papa got a job at the TVA and he bought a washing machine and a Chevrolet. Sweet potato pie, I shut my mouth. <laughs> right? So, and, and so you would go through all these songs, right? But there was one song in particular. One song in particular for us. For, I'm not saying it had to be your song. Speak your truth to your song. Right? But, but for us, for us, there was one song in particular that kind of got the adrenaline pumping. It was, in my eyes, the greatest masterpiece of all time by Al Beck. And that was Roll On 18 Wheeler. Rolling. And if there were four or six of us in that 1972 K5 Blazer, and we were rolling, when that song came on, you didn't necessarily have to find a back road, you didn't have to put your hand over your heart, but you did need to find something to get the adrenaline pumping. Because we got the adrenaline pumping. Because maybe, maybe you don't know what's going on in that song. Now, let me tell you of the saga of Daddy the truck driver and his wife and the kids. Right? Because see, I don't know if you know it, but in that song, Daddy drove an 18-wheeler. Right? And, and so what happened was on Monday morning, <laughs> on, on Monday morning, the family all gathered around. Right? The family all gathered around. They were sad. In fact, three sad faces gathered around mom. Right? And, and, and Daddy was leaving, and he was leaving on a Midwest run, and he would be away for a little while. Right? And when Daddy would be away for a little while, he left instructions to his family. Right? And his instructions were, pray for me and sing this song. Right? Roll on, 18-wheeler. Roll on along. Roll on, Daddy, till you get back home. And roll on, family. Roll on, crew. Roll on, Mama. Roll on, Mama, like they ask you to do. Right? Roll on, 18-wheeler. Roll on. Roll on. Roll on. Right. And so, so he would leave them instructions to do so. And then he would hit the road and he would say it. And he called them every night. He told them. He loved them. Right. And, and so some days passed. Right? Some days passed. And, and then on Wednesday evening there was trouble. But we'll get to that in a minute. Right? So, so guess who was driving in one particular moment when this song came on? Right? So I was behind the wheel of the 1972 K5 Blazer. And there was about six of us packed in to that truck, right to that blazer. And so we were riding down the road, and the sun was coming in, and it was blue sky. It wasn't a cloud in sight. And the music was pumping, and the, and the, and the back subwoofers. And I don't know if you've ever heard the beginning of that song, but there was a pause in between songs. And I'm driving down the road, and we're all feeling pretty good. And all of a sudden, if you're familiar with the beginning of that song, there was a pause, and then you hear an 18-wheeler crank up. And you hear a car door open, and then you hear this fella on the CB radio, How about you, Alabama? Roll on! Yeah. Right? Yeah! And, and that came on the radio, and I was behind the wheel, and I said, Baby, we're going to find an adventure. And everybody said, Yeah! And everybody started saying, But at that time, we weren't on the back road. At that time, we were in town. We were in downtown, Silver. 
that is an oxymoron. But we were in downtown Sydney. Right? And so we're rolling through town. How about you, man? Roll on. I said, don't worry, boys. I'll find us an adventure. And it starts out, mom and the kids, right? Midwest run. Daddy's gone. And I'm feeling it. And I'm looking for an adventure, you know, for us to go to. And, and I can't find anything. There's nothing but the buildings. And, and then it gets to the part where Wednesday evening, I don't know if you know this, but Mama was waiting by the phone. <laughs> and it rained, but it, it, it was not his voice, right? Well, it seems that the Highway Patrol found a jackknife rig in a snowman in Illinois. And I know this is dramatic, but the driver was missing and the search had been abandoned. And the weather had everything stalled. And, and now the Highway Patrol, they did their job. They checked all the houses and the motels. And, and they said when they had some more news, they called. <laughs> and, and, and so I'm hearing that, and my heart beats, my heart beats like the subwoofer, boom, 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 right, and I'm feeling that, everybody in there, man, find us an adventure, because the adrenaline trip needs to match the adrenaline the radio, the mood needs to match the action, the action needs to match the mood, and so I'm looking, I'm, and it's getting tight, because we've never not found an adventure during Roll on 18 Wheeler, but we've never been stuck in town during that song. So I'm looking, I'm looking, and, and man, I'm getting away, and I do get carried away with music. I, I've told you before, I'm the guy you make fun of at a stoplight. You know? <laughs> and, and I'm getting carried away with the music, and I'm feeling it, and, and, and so it goes through, and then it gets to the part that gets me to, to, to that. Like, if you were beside me in traffic, I might get choked up during this part, because this is where Mama nails it, right? And, and, and Mama, they tell her the bad news. We don't know where he is. And Mama says unflinchingly, well, you tell him when you find him that I love him. And she hung up the phone singing, roll on highway, right? And so she <laughs> sings with the kids. Well, and yeah, and, and it's, it's tough. And you don't know what Mama and the kids are going through in that moment. But here's the good news. And this is where, oh, but the man upstairs was listening. When Mama asked him to bring Daddy home. And when the call came in, it was Daddy on the other end asking her if she had been a singing the song. <laughs> right? and, and at that moment, like at that moment, like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right? And, 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 at that moment, right? Like at that moment, like we've got to find something. Because something has to match what's happening in here. And so I look around and I come, I just hit a, I, I quickly take a right turn and there's an abandoned building with an abandoned parking lot. And we know this parking lot, we know this building had been used for business and like, well, the whole time we've been there, some of us were there longer than four years. And, and we hadn't seen any action in that building or in that parking lot. And in that parking lot of that abandoned building and that abandoned parking lot, is this mulch pile, dirt pile, trash pile that in my memory is like 100 feet tall. I don't know how big it was. It was bigger than a 1972 K-5 place. <laughs> and my adrenaline was pumping out of my chest. And I do a quick peripheral and I cut into that parking lot and I say, hang on boys! And we take the K-5 to the front end of that dirt pile and the front end, boom, 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 goes up and I floor it and we go up that dirt pile to about the back tires and then the front end, boom, goes straight down into the dirt pile, like up to the top bunk and the back tires in the dirt pile. Tommy, who owns the 1972 K-5 Blake, just looks at me and says, I said, I'll get us out and I'll rock it. Now, just deep. Deeper. And I think it was jacked up, big old tires, is up to the bumpers, above the door. We're just sunk. In town, in the middle of the day. And the music starts to fade. Roll on. <laughs> 18 wheelers. And it's repeating. 18 wheelers. 18 and the music stops. The next sound we heard was not the sweet sounds of Alabama. The next sounds we heard, says your pastor to you, were. <laughs> and the cop 
cops came into the parking lot, got out, shaking their heads. <laughs> we just sit there with our heads down, like maybe if we don't make eye contact, they won't see us. You know? <laughs> Boys, what do you think you're doing? Every finger points to the driver. <laughs> good friends, really good friends. I said, yes, it, you know, it's my fault. I got carried away with myself. I said, have you ever heard about that? <laughs> so the next few hours of our life, we're spent, we're spent waiting on the owner of that property to come and us, shoveling mulch and dirt and trash, <laughs> shoveling it out, getting the truck out, sweeping up the entire parking lot of an abandoned factory parking lot that had been abandoned for years and years. People hadn't been kind to that parking lot. Sweeping it clean, picking mulch up out of the bumper. Every last piece had to be put back on the mulch. Finally, the owner showed up and he had a sense of humor, thank goodness. And, and so he told us, you know, boys, let me tell you what's going to happen if you ever do this again. And we got that, right? But he, he kind of, they worked with us and we got it. And I do not have a criminal record. <laughs> and, and in that moment, like, in that moment we sunk, that was the moment where, you know, like it, the moment in any male age 13 to 113, <laughs> <laughs> where the adrenaline's pumping and you want to do something based on your mood and then it ends up disastrous in that moment after where you're like, what was I thinking? What was I doing? I knew what was right and what was right was not to trespass and break and enter and ruin somebody's trash pile and potentially ruin the joke. The K-5 pleasure was okay. It didn't seem worse. Right. But I knew better than that. But my mood at the moment did not dictate that. And I made an action based on how I felt, based on my mood, versus based on what I knew. Let me tell you something. We're going to unpack this scripture. Mark 14, verses 51 through 52. And, and what you're going to see, it's a strange little passage. It's super strange. Right? And it's okay to laugh during this passage, right? But it's super strange passage that we're going to read. But, but what I want to show you in this passage, what I, what I want us to see in this passage, is, is that this is actually, it's, these are actually two verses about following Jesus. Kind of, kind of here's what it looks like when you're eh, sort of following Jesus, and, and that points us to what it looks like to follow Jesus. And, and we're going to see that, but, but here's what I want you to wrap your brain around before we unpack it. Because, because I think this is critical. In fact, if I think we could, if, if, if we could wrap our brains around this as Christians, if we could wrap our brains around what I'm about to tell you as, as followers of Jesus Christ, I think it would change the way in which we approached Jesus. And, and what I mean by that is I think, this is what I think, and usually if I say I think and it's followed by Christians or the church, that means, that means I'm guilty of it, okay? Because otherwise I wouldn't think it. I know it personally, okay? So... I think as Christians, I, I think as followers of Jesus Christ, we often act on the mood, how we feel at the moment, versus the conviction of who we know to be true. I, I think, in fact, we, we often say, well, what does it mean to be a Christian? You don't have to answer this out loud. You can if you want to. But if, if I were to say, what does it mean to be a Christian? I think a lot of us might say, well, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. There was, there was a moment where, where I, gave, I admitted I was a sinner and I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. And so I'm destined for heaven. And I hope I don't screw it up before I die. I think a lot of us would probably have that view of Christianity. That is not following Jesus Christ. Yeah, there's, there's the realization that we're sinners. That's true. Take about two seconds with yourself. We're sinners. So there's, there's the realization of that. And, and the realization that the only way to heaven is perfection and holiness, which doesn't include sin. So if, if not for the cross and forgiveness, Jesus dying for my sins, then I would have no hope of it. So yes, I'm a sinner. 
Yes, Jesus died for me. Truth. Yes, Jesus rose victorious. God accepted the sacrifice and Jesus is the first fruits of what we will be and we will rise victorious and be in heaven. Truth. But when we made that decision to follow Jesus, He didn't immediately just track the beam us up to heaven. I, I know it because you're still here. Me too. You do not, listen, you do not have to spend the rest of your life trying not to screw it up. You spend the rest of your life following Jesus. Now, what does that mean? Because a lot of us say, well, i got to take the good with the bad. I get heaven good. <laughs> that is good. I, I get heaven is good beyond good, right? Uh, Jesus died for my sins, and I accepted him as my Savior, and, and like I embraced him as my Savior. Thank you, right? He's my Savior, and I'm going to go to heaven, and that is good. Amen. Amen. Well, there is better waiting for us. We're just visiting here. This is temporary, and there will be eternal and truth. <clears throat> but when we started following Him, when we started walking with Him, it wasn't a, I made a momentary decision, and I hope I go to heaven, and I hope I don't screw it up in between. At that moment where we decided to start following Jesus was the moment we began to know Jesus. That was the moment we literally stepped into eternal life. It was the moment we stepped into this relationship with Jesus. And so a lot of us say, well, a relationship with Jesus, that means I know God exists, and that means um, I know Jesus died for me, and so I'm cognizant of all these things. I know all these things. But does it really affect how I live every day? Well, I try not to, I try not to do too many sins a day. I, but Jesus said, if I think about it, that's a sin. And so if I were to inventory my thoughts. <laughs> Jeez Louise. Remember that time I almost got arrested in a 1972 K-5 blazer? <laughs> <laughs> but, it's it. That's, that's not how it is. And, and so there's this beautiful thing that we're missing out on. We, we think a lot of times, well, I accepted Jesus as my Savior and I get to go to heaven. Whew, thank goodness. But now I have to be really good for the rest of my life. And so I kind of have to take the good with the bad. I'll bargain with Jesus. If you give me heaven, I'll try my best. That's not... That's not following Jesus. It's not. Following Jesus is, is this relationship. And that's what we're, that's what we're about to unpack. And so so if, like if you're honest with yourself and you say, maybe I don't really know what it is to like follow Jesus. Maybe, maybe I, I'm, I'm well versed in, yes, I'm a sinner, I give my life to Jesus, but Maybe I thought following Jesus was just trying to be good and trying to do right and not upsetting God and just respecting. Then I want you to listen up. I, I want you to listen up because I think this could be crucial, critical, because following Jesus is not based on your mood. Right? And because I think if, if a lot of times we say, well, I'll, I'll just do my best, that's based on our mood. Like, I wake up on the wrong side of the bed. I've been known to do that a time or two myself. Right? And I just wake up grumpy. Right, mean or lazy or apathetic. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna probably not do so great today. It's not based on your mood. It's based on your relationship. Now we're gonna we're gonna unpack this. Okay, we're gonna unpack that. So so let's read this. Let's read this. Mark 14, verses 51, 52. Super quick summary. I promise. Super quick summary. Mark 14. Right? So you've heard me say before, uh, a, a Mark sandwich. Mark and then sandwich is what theologians call that, right? Where Mark, oftentimes in his gospel, he'll start with something and then he'll put a story in the middle and then he'll finish with the continuation of that first something and kind of makes this sandwich, right? And so, so Mark 14 is, is kind of the same thing, right? So there's three prophecies. Three fulfillments and the garden in the middle. So there's there's three prophecies. Hey, uh, somebody here is going to betray me. Judas. Judas betrayed him. Prophecy fulfilled. Somebody, Peter, by the way, you're going to deny me three times. Right? Prophecy fulfilled. Peter did it. Denied him three times. Hey, everybody's going to leave me. Mark 14, 50. They all left. They all fled. Prophecy fulfilled. So Mark 14 has these three prophecies, these three fulfillments, and right in the middle is Jesus in the garden. And so, so what's happening here? Mark's saying Jesus is going to be alone. 
He's going to be isolated. Peter's going to leave him. Judas is going to leave him. Two of his followers. Everybody's going to leave him. And right in the middle of all that, Jesus is going to be by himself in the garden in excruciating agony. You don't think it... You don't think your Savior knows what it's like to be alone when you're alone? When you feel abandoned? When you feel isolated? When you feel lonely and sad? He knows what that is. He knows what that's like. And so right in the middle, there's this sandwich where Jesus is in the garden, right? And so following Jesus in the garden and praying and agony and sweating drops of blood and Peter and the guys falling asleep, Peter and James and John sleeping through the job while Jesus is praying... And then people come and Peter cuts off some dude's ear, right? Malchus, the high priest servant, cuts off his ear and Jesus restores it. And they're, they're seizing Jesus to arrest him. In verse 50, they all left him. They all left him and fled. Maybe I went over there looking for my glasses. I may have just had them. All right. Verse 51. And a young man followed him. A young man followed him. And, and if you're a Bible writer, circle it. And if you're not, just put it in your mind. That word followed, we're going to come back to that. A young man followed him. Now, we'll break that down, but it's, it's kind of from a distance. Followed him like... Like from a distance. All right, so a young man, that's all we know about him, he's a, a young man, he followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. Now, now here's what you need to know about that, right? So nothing but a, so that's kind of like his underwear. Kind of like what you sleep in, right? Like maybe when you were growing up, if you woke up at 2 in the morning and you went into the kitchen in front of the fridge and there's your dad in his boxer shorts and his V-neck t-shirt <laughs> scratching his belly in front of the fridge, right? Hypothetically. Right? That's, he was in his, his box of shorts and his t-shirt. So Mark, or this uh, young man, who's not Mark, we'll talk about that. Maybe, maybe not. But, but this young man, this young man's following at a distance, and he's in his, his bed clothes. He's in his t-shirt. And he's following at a distance in his bed clothes, in linen cloth, nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him, the guards that came for Jesus to arrest him. The guards that were trying to get everybody. The guards and the, the high priest uh, servants and everybody. The religious guards. They seized this young man in his t-shirt, in his linen cloth. Now, that word seized, that's the same word, same, same source, same word that's used up in the passage above for what they did to Jesus. They came to seize him. So, all that tells you is, it's tense. It's tense in the guard. And they came to seize Jesus. And they came to seize everybody with Jesus. And this young man who's over in the bushes, who's kind of peeking, kind of following at a distance, they seized him. And they grabbed his linen cloth. They seized him. Verse 52. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. He left the linen cloth and ran away naked. So they grabbed his cloth and he just kind of spun out of it, did like a, a Madden joystick move, and he spun out of it, and he's running out naked. He ain't Lou, he ain't Rude. He's just in the mood of running and do. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they call him the street. <laughs> <laughs> so he's... Look at that movie. He's running. <laughs> running as fast as he can. Right? Running as fast as he can, just butt naked. But neck just running away from the garden. Just neck, neck isn't afraid if you're a Discovery Channel walker, right? And he, he's running away, and don't, don't worry, we have no visual aids today during today's message. <laughs> anyway, you think about that. All right, so, so he's running away naked, right? Now, so, so he comes and follows at a distance, and he peeks, and they seize him on his linen cloth and his bed clothes, and he spins out, and he runs away naked. And, and, and he's running down, down into the wood, through the valley of Kidron, probably back to his place. A strange passage. That's a super strange passage. And, so, and it's not in the other Gospels. And so you're looking at this passage and you're like, what? what? What's going on? Well, here's what we know. Here's what we know. All right? 
So, so these young uh, scholars who are smarter than I, I think that probably means like 15 to 17 ish. I don't know. That's what some smart people say. Right? He's young. Right? He's a young man. He's, he's kind of following behind from a distance. And he's in a linen cloth. And that would mean he's probably got a little wealth to him. His family. Probably has some wealth. Because the wealthy families kind of had this linen undergarment. So, so he's got a linen cloth. And, and a lot of people think this could be Mark, the writer of this gospel, John Mark. A lot of people think that's why it's in here. And, and they say, well, hypothetically, it could go like this, right? Is that they met, Jesus and the disciples met in the upper room. Most folks think that, think that that was the house of John Mark later in Acts where Peter was in prison and came knocking on the door and all that. Most people think that was John Mark's mother's house. And so a lot of people say, well, the disciples were in the upper room in that house and then they left and this young man, Mark, was kind of curious and he was in his bed clothes because he was supposed to be in bed but if you've ever raised kids and you know you're trying to watch a TV show that you can only watch once the kids go to bed, they're always sneaking around the house Kind of hypothetically, right? And so, so a lot of people say, well, Mark just kind of snuck out of the house. He snuck out of the house and he followed from a distance because he knew he shouldn't be there and he didn't have time to change into his clothes, he was in his bed clothes and kind of followed in a distance. And a lot of people say, well, that makes sense because how we get the description of the Garden of Gethsemane, if all the disciples were sleeping, somebody would have had to have been watching Jesus sweat and drops of blood. Okay, so maybe, no kidding, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's John Mark. That was a tradition that came about a couple of hundred years after the church was formed. And so it is entirely possible and rational. It's in the book of Mark. Maybe he refers to himself anonymously. So, maybe. That's not the point today. We don't, we don't care about who that is. Right? His name could be Mark or it could be Rufus. Okay. Right? But, but this guy, this young man, kind of comes in there and he's watching from a distance. Right? The question that we should be asking isn't, who is that? question we should be asking literally is why is that in there? In fact, I think that's one of the greatest Bible study questions to ask when you're reading scripture is to say why did you put that in there? What? Tell me again why you would do that? And so, and so we, we go through it, right? And, and, and we wonder about some things. There's some things we know and things we don't know. I'm here to tell you this morning, I think it's in there because it points us to one of the deepest theological truths we can see. Right? And that's about following Jesus. Because let's, let's just, can we just say, like, the, the reason we meet on Sunday mornings is because we're followers of Jesus. That's why. Not to check a box, not for a social connection. It's, it's not for perfect attendance so that when you get to heaven, you can say, God, this is the church I attended, 1630, Jericho Church Road. They met 945 every Sunday mornings, and, and sometimes the preacher went really long, so I need an extra jewel in my crown. Right? So that's not why you show up on Sunday morning. You show up on Sunday mornings because you're a follower of Jesus Christ. And, and you want to meet with other followers of Jesus Christ and encourage one another and learn more about His Word, right? So we're followers of Jesus Christ. And so what these two verses do is, if you ask me, what we're hopefully about to see is they unpack what it means to follow Jesus. And I think they unpack what it means to how some of us follow Jesus and how we should follow Jesus, right? So, first question answer. If we say, all right, well, Christianity following Jesus is not based on our mood because as we saw in the opening story, a mood can get you into trouble. Right? It's not based on the mood, it's based on the conviction of who we follow. So get that in your brain. Following Jesus is about a conviction of who Jesus is. So, alright, we'll read this story. Okay, why is he naked? We can just ask that in church on a Sunday morning, that's okay. Right? So, so naked, that shows up a lot in the Bible, right? There was an Old Testament prophet who like, was called to preach naked. You want something to be thankful for this week? Your pastor is not. You see, back home. Right? So, so sometimes in the Bible, there's, there's nakedness, but where does it go back to? Like, what do you think of immediately when you think of naked in the Bible? You think of Adam and Eve, probably, don't you? Right? And so you go back all the way, and from the beginning, you see kind of this association of naked and ashamed. You see this kind of shame come into view with naked, right? Because from the very beginning, Adam and Eve, man, they didn't need clothes. They didn't have to order clothes on Amazon. They didn't have to go to the store. They didn't have to worry when all the kids grew out of their clothes in three months and they had to get new clothes and new, hypothetically. Right? And so they just, they didn't have to worry about clothes. They just walked with God in the cool of the day and didn't worry about it. Until what? Until they ate the fruit, had its realization, kind of revealed who much, too much of who they were. 
and shame entered. Sin entered. And so from the very beginning, you have this association of nakedness and shame. Your preacher did not tell you to go home and feel naked and feel ashamed about whatever, okay? What I'm telling you is in the Bible, there's symbolism between being naked and shame. Then you see in the Old Testament how you see a lot of times God says, well, I'm going to send in a, an army and they're going to take over. You're going to be stripped away from everything. And so it just like equates shame. So there's this association in the Bible of nakedness and shamefulness, right? And so if you look at this, right, you, you see this association with nakedness and shame. And you look at this and you say, but why would there be shame on this guy? Because he's doing a noble thing. Right? This young man is following Jesus from a distance, peeking on the disciples and on Jesus in the garden. Why on earth would you associate shame with that? Why would, why would you say, well, he's fleeing away naked and that's, that's shameful. Why would you associate those two things together? Because he seems to be doing a noble thing. Remember I told you to either circle that word in your mind or in your Bible. And a young man followed him. Followed. That, that word in verse 51, followed, is a different form of the word follow than you find in, say, Mark 1.17, where Jesus looks at the disciples and he says, follow me. It's a different word. So this word follow means to accompany. To, to just... To just kind of hang out with. To just maybe even watch at a distance. To follow and just kind of apathetically say, yeah, there's Jesus. Mark 1.17, like when Jesus says, follow me, earlier in this same gospel, when Jesus says, follow me in Mark 1.17, what he's, the, the root of that word is to go in the direction that I'm going. To stop going in the direction you're going and go in the direction that I'm going. And, and like uh, Matthew 16, 24, he says, count the cost. Everybody wants to follow me, count the cost. You're going to have to give up some stuff to follow me. But Mark 14, 51 says, this young man was following at a distance. Now in our lives, there are two ways in which we can follow Jesus as Christians. Nope. There's one way in which we can follow Jesus as a Christian, but oftentimes we choose the other. Oftentimes we say, I'll just accompany Jesus. I'll show up when I feel like it, and I'll also stay in my comfortable spot, and I'll watch him from a distance, and I'll watch him work, and I'll see what he does. Can I tell you something? It's dangerous. It's dangerous in a bad way. What that can lead to is nothing but trouble. Ask a young naked man who had to flee you out of being seized from somebody. Here's, here's what it can lead to when you just accompany Jesus. Let's look at the negative first. Here's what it can lead to. It's boredom. Can I tell you that? It's boredom. You say, well, I gave Jesus my heart long ago and, and I'm waiting on Him to do something. While I sit over here, I sure hope he does something. Oh, Jesus is at church on Sunday. I'll go to church on Sunday. Jesus, and I, and I wait for him to do something. But there's no interaction. There's no, there's no changing the direction of where my life was to the direction that Jesus is. You know what happened to King David in 2 Samuel? Between 2 Samuel 7 in 2 Samuel 11, he got bored. See, in, in 2 Samuel 7, if you go back tonight and you look, or right now, if you're bored with the sermon, you go back and look, 2 Samuel 7, it starts naming these awesome accomplishments of David and how he forms his covenant and how there's this covenant formed. And then you'll see just the subtitles. If you go through 7 through, through 10, you'll see like David defeats such and such. David's victorious over such and such. David appoints kind of his counsel. Boom, 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 boom. And he's doing all these things. And then when you get to 2 Samuel 11, you know what he's doing? Hanging out on the rooftop. 
sending his people to go fight while he hangs back. You remember what happened? They saw this little hot mama in town named Bathsheba from his rooftop. And he saw her bathing. And he says, I'm going to make that woman mine, even though she's somebody else's husband. She, she's somebody else's wife. And he had her husband killed. And he had an affair with her. And they had a baby. And it was rough. You know how he got from 2 Samuel 7 to 2 Samuel 11? He got bored. He decided to stop going out and fighting. He decided enough of changing the direction of where my natural heart wants to go. Enough of that. That's hard. I just want to put it on cruise control. You ever been on a trip and you're tired of pushing the gas pedal? And you're tired of all that mess? And you're like, I just want to put it on cruise control. And then somebody slow comes up in front of you. Or somebody slow in the passing lane, even worse. And you've got to cut that thing off. Hypothetically. <laughs> he just had his life on cruise control and he left. He's like, I took care of everything already. I checked all the boxes I need to check. I volunteered for that. I did that. I put my time in for that. I asked Jesus in my heart at summer camp when I was a kid. Somebody else's turn to do something now. You know what happened? He stopped following Jesus. He stopped following God. He just started kind of accompanying him. And he hung out on the rooftop. And he got in trouble. Because he got bored. And if you're following Jesus like that, you'll get bored. You'll get bored. It's boring to follow Jesus like it is. It's boring. And uh, Jim Rayburn, uh, Jim Rayburn, founder of Young Life Ministries, and I read his autobiography years and years ago, and, and I, if you quiz me on the book, I couldn't remember much, but I remember this one line. It's a sin to bore kids with the gospel. That's, that was the essence of who he was. And I think not just kids, anybody. And I think if, if, you're, if you're following Jesus, if you say, I'm a follower of Jesus, but it's kind of boring. And I ain't fussing at you if you get bored with me, right? I'm not Jesus. But if you're following Jesus and you're bored with him, you're probably not following the way that he intended you to follow. So David got bored because he just kind of started accompanying Jesus. Here's the other dangerous thing that happens, is you get separated from Jesus. You know, we talked about Adam and Eve already, right? Is, is you get separated from Jesus. Remember what happened in the Garden of Eden? Right? Remember Adam and Eve, they found out they were naked. They went and they were like, there's got to be some big leaves around here. I hope it's not poison ivy, poison oak leaves. I hope it was just big leaves. And they put them on, right, to cover each other so that they wouldn't see each other. And they walk around and God shows up in the garden. He's like, where are you guys at? It's time for a walk. And they're what? Hiding. Because they were ashamed. But they stopped walking with them hand in hand. Man, if you followed Jesus where you felt like you were walking with him hand in hand, That's not pie in the sky stuff. That's, to be honest, that's what it looks like. But you're like, man, I'm walking today with Jesus holding my hand. It's not based on a mood. It's based on a conviction of who you know. And if that's not what following Jesus looks like in your heart, I think you should examine your heart. And there are probably some things to surrender in your heart. Where, where you have to say, Jesus, I've just been accompanying you lately. Well, for most of my life. And, and separation leads to blame. Tara and I heard a guy this week who, who made this incredible point. He, and he, he reminded us of a truth we already knew. But he said, uh, he said, you know, remember in the garden when... When God asked Adam, who gave you this fruit or who told you about this fruit? And a lot of us immediately say, like, well, Adam sold Eve out to dry. And he was like, the woman did it. Right? But, but if you really look at that, right, if you really look at that, he said, what? The woman you gave me did it. And Adam was separated from God, and what he was doing was blaming God. 
He says, your thought, you gave me a woman. Woman, you gave me. And when we get separated from God, that's what we do. We blame Him for things. Are you listening? We get separated from God and we say, why is stuff so tough right now? Where are you at? Why didn't this go my way? Where are you at? I thought things would be better by now. I thought things would turn out differently. I didn't think I would be struggling with this at this season in my life. Where are you at? And when we're separated from God, we begin to blame God. And you get separated with God when your idea of following Him is accompanying Him. Okay, great. Don't accompany God. <clears throat> follow Him. So what does it mean to follow Him? Like in Mark 1.17 when He says, follow me. What does that even mean? Right? If, if you say, okay, Wes, I got you. Follow Him. What does that mean? So, so it's changing your direction and following Him. And remember, Jesus was this rabbi teacher, right? So He was Lord. He was teacher. He was Son of God, Son of Man. But this idea of rabbi was crucial during the day. And so if you followed a teacher, because there were disciples, right? A person who followed a rabbi was a disciple. And so there were these, these 12 disciples who followed their rabbi. And what did that mean? It meant that they followed behind and they listened to his teachings and, and they did what he did. And, and a lot of times they would talk about the dust, right? And I think we've talked about that before. Is, is the rabbi would kind of be in front and he would be teaching, right? And he would say, you know, the kingdom of God is like this. And the disciples would be behind him and they would be following him so closely that the dust kicked up from his sandals would be on them. Like if you've ever been on a dirt road and you followed somebody after you washed your car. Like if you've ever been in an elevator with a woman who had too much perfume or a man who had too much cologne and you got off that elevator and you got back home and your wife or husband said, why do you smell like that? Right? Hypothetically. <laughs> that is hypothetical. Right? It, it's, it's just only, it's only because you're just... And, and to, to be a follower of Jesus Christ to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, to follow Him the way that you follow Him. You don't just say, well, I heard His teaching and I'm going to do my best. But you, you don't necessarily read the text of what He's saying. You do. But you also read the text of who He is. So to follow Jesus would be to say, well, I, I want to know what He's teaching in here. And, and I, but I also want to see how He's living. I want to see how He's interacting with the poor. I want to see how He interacts with the religious leaders. I want to see how He interacts with, 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 with followers and non-followers. I, I want to watch Him do what He does. And then guess what? I want to imitate that. That's what the Bible would say. Look, Luke would say in, in a passage, hey, you do like I do. I'm going to show you what to do. Jesus came to show us how to live. But listen, as Christians we say, I'm glad Jesus lived like that so I don't have to. I'm glad Jesus died like that so I don't have to. Jesus lived like that to show me how to live. So to be a follower of Jesus Christ, now listen to this, this ain't anything. To be a follower of Jesus Christ means to live like Jesus lived. And when you stumble and you fall and you mess up and you screw up, the grace of God falls upon you and you are washed clean, no worries, and, and He picks you up and you do it again and He's still at work in you, in your heart, so that you can continue that that life of following you. Every day you say, well, how am I supposed to live today? Well, I'm going to imitate how Jesus lived and, inter and interact with people. I'm going to, you see, that's a lot more work. That's a lot more work than... That's a, that's a lot more work than... That's right in the middle of it. And you're not going to heaven based on the amount of work you do. That's what the gospel says. That's a free gift. The gift of salvation, I would say, is a free gift. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you've given your heart to Him and surrendered your life to Him, heaven is yours. You're, you're, if you haven't, you're not. But if you have, you're going to heaven. That's a free gift. But this life that you're living with Him, if you don't want to be bored and you don't want to be separated and you want to enjoy what it is to feel His hand while you walk hand in hand, that's involvement. That's getting right there in the middle of it. Watching how Jesus lived and reading the text of his life and saying, I'm going to live that out.
How do you teach? How do you live? And so you, you say all that, and you say, okay, I don't want to be bored. I don't. I don't want to be separated. I don't. I want to walk hand in hand with him. I don't want my life with Jesus to be based on the mood that I'm in. Because I'll be in trouble quick. I want my life with Jesus to be based on who he is. How do I live that? I follow him. I imitate him. I learn about him. I pray with him. I get to know him. Everything in my life is like, oh, I just surrender to him. Because I'm following him. I've changed the direction of where my life went. I follow him. So, we just saw Garden of Gethsemane. Everybody's flipping out. Peter's taking a sword and cutting off ears. The disciples are scattering every direction. Some guy's nude in the corner. It's crazy. It's nuts. And then there's this one guy in the middle. Jesus. Who's calm and under control. And he's like, man, I poured out my heart to God. And I said, if it can pass from me, let it pass. It ain't passing. So I'll submit to God's will. That's what we're supposed to imitate. Pour our hearts out to God and say, but if that ain't your will, I'm down with your will because you know better about what's about to happen than I do. So I trust you. I'll submit to you. That's the kind of stuff. When you read about Jesus and you say, well, I'm supposed to live like that? Yeah. Yeah. You are. We are. Now, what that builds in you when you start, when you start walking that walk is not dread. It's not, oh, my gosh, i got to be a Christian again today. Oh, man, i got to follow Jesus again today. And I bet you know a Christian like that, right? Who looks like they've been stuck in on women's all day long. I love Jesus. Right? <laughs> Hey, I love you too, but be quiet. Don't tell anybody you know Jesus because God wants you screwing it up for the rest of us. Right? That's, that's not what it looks like. Right? What, what it looks like is, man, this is tough, but I'm in this with you. And there's freedom in that. Freedom. I'm telling you, I'm telling you because I know that there is freedom in walking a walk that you don't necessarily want to walk. Walking a walk that you would never choose for yourself. But walking a walk where you're like, well, this is what you said do. I prayed that this would be a little easier. It's not. But you said this walk is the walk. So I'm walking with you. And can I tell you? That's freedom in Christ. And you know what builds in your heart? I'm finishing up. You know what? You were like, two verses. <laughs> Make a reservation for 1130. Nah, you knew better than that. Right? You know what that builds in your heart? You know what builds in your heart? When, when you're living like that is hope. Because you learn that God has your life under control. And you don't want to live without hope. But when you start living with the hope of God in your life, you start living for God, you're like, I, you know what, I trust you. And you know what, this is way more beautiful than I thought it was going to be. And you know what, I never would have seen this, but you made this happen, and this is awesome. And, and hope starts to build. There was this test at John Hopkins University, right, this test at John Hopkins University, years ago, this famous test, where they took these lab rats, and took these rats, because nobody cares about rats, because they're ugly, you got to be cute animal for people to care about your life, right, and they took these rats, and they said, how long can a rat swim before it drowns, <laughs> it's like the most famous <laughs> test ever, but they took these rats, and they put them in water, and they said, how long can you swim, and they just stepped back, and they timed it, Boop. 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Dead wet rat. 10 minutes. That's awful. So then they said, okay, we've got our constant. Now let's see what happens if we're throwing a bear. So then they put a rat in and it swam and dreaded water for about two to three minutes. And every two to three minutes they would take it out and let it breathe. And then they would put it right back in. Just <gasps> and they would do that every two to three minutes. They would take it out, put it back in. Now, how long it lasted? 90 minutes. You know why? Because the introduction of hope. 
You know, you, you won't make it in life without hope. But if you follow God, if you say, I'm changing the direction of my life, I have a new direction in my life, and it is Jesus Christ. And I want to know everything about Him, and every day I'm going to learn more about Him. And I'm going to follow Him to the end. You know what builds in your heart? Hope. Hope. Trust. Faith. You know when that won't happen? If you accompany Him, if you peek from the sidelines, you end up in trouble. You end up wondering where He's at. But if you follow Him, man, that's freedom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want that. We want freedom. We want that. We want hope. We want all those things. But Lord, what we want most, can we just say it? That's you. We want you. And God, if we don't, I pray that our hearts would change. I pray that we would hunger and thirst for you. I pray, Jesus, that, that we, would, we would wake up each day and say, man, I want to know Jesus. And that that would build in our hearts and we'd be different because of it. We ask this.